Uh, again, uh, thank you uh, for, for coming, for joining us. And uh, my name is uh, Anatoly Motkin. I'm president of Strategist. And today the topic of our Strategist Live session is Eurasia in European AI ecosystem. In February this year, the European Commission has released the white paper on artificial intelligence, European approach to excellence and trust, in which the basic principles and tasks for building the AI ecosystem of trust and excellence in the European Union are formulated. Given the success of AI-based projects in Eurasia, especially Belarusian and Ukrainian, it is important that this region can become part of the global AI ecosystem. What should be done by Eurasian governments, leaders of the IT industry and EU officials? So first, let me introduce our distinguished guests. It's Nino Inukidze, Rector of Business and Technology University, Georgia, uh, Gary Feller, CEO, President, and Co-Founder of GSD Venture Studios and one of the top uh, AI visionaries today in the world, and Oles Petrif, CTO of Reface AI, one of the, I think, most successful AI projects these days in the Eurasian region. So the first question would be, um, in AI white paper of a uh, European Union, the European Commission on one hand recognizes that EU is far behind US and Asia, I think mainly China, and uh, in AI development, and on the other hand, it sets ambition goals for EU to develop this, this industry. So what does it take for the countries of Eurasia to become an integral part of the European project for the development of artificial intelligence? And this question I would like to address you, Nino, uh, from your perspective, and in your university, you have an AI, uh, special AI center. So maybe you could just tell uh, in a couple of words, how does it look like from Georgian perspective? And, the, and the, how do you look on the integration with Georgian uh, experience with the EU, EU ambitions, please? Well, thank you very much, um, Anatoly, for inviting me for the discussion. Um, we have the, uh, started this kind of discussion in terms of um, so-called forum hand, held in Georgia one year ago when we discussed possible um, uh, development of national AI strategy in the country and um, integrating AI solutions to the different industries. So what I think, first of all, is that it's time for every country in the Eurasian region, without an exception, to start thinking about developing the national AI strategy. So from global, um, you know, long-term perspective, the development of national AI strategy will, will definitely define the right direction of countries' socioeconomic development in uh, Eurasia. So what I can say is there are countries in uh, Eurasian countries willing to become an integral part of the European project. Um, these countries need to have clear vision on how to boost technology and industrial capacity through access to public sector data, um, addressing some certain socioeconomic ch challenges, especially in labor markets, and how to you know, ensure the adequate uh, legal and ethical framework while uh, adopting these strategies. At Business and Technology University, what, what I can say is that um, we have recently finalized the research paper, the first part of the research um, in terms of um, analyzing the needs of adopting the national AI strategy to the country. And the results demonstrate that there are cer certain, um, 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 you know, uh, the absence of national AI strategy is really serious concern and uh, can, can bring really uh, serious threats to the country in, in the nearest future. What um, I can say now is that the European Union uh, is one of, one of the leading powers supporting the development of strategies by its member countries, even though there are several, um, and not few, by the way, countries in the region which have not, not only adopted the strategy, but even thought about um, the need. Uh, there are 25 European countries who signed the Declaration of Cooperation on Artificial Intelligence. I think it was two years ago, and, uh, but still there are several um, cases in the Eurasian region who do not have such a strategy, and uh, I think it's something we have to discuss. What, one more thing what I want to say is that um, definitely national strategies will be different um, regarding the countries because every country has, has its strategic sectors willing to uh, be developed, but for sure there are several directions which um, countries should at least cover if they are willing to become an integral part 
of the European project. So these directions are, first of all, data protection laws, which we have to think about. These directions are uh, the research environment and the ways to support the whole research ecosystem within the region. These are the directions covering workforce uh, preparation for um, job displacement. Uh, I mean, reskilling and upskilling the, the workforce for, for future jobs, which will um, exist in, in the nearest future. These are strategic, strategic sectors um, where to invest and where to uh, integrate the AI solutions. And I think last but not, not least is uh, certain strategy and uh, vision of engaging in international collaboration, which some countries still do not have. So if we are, if we are discussing the European project and the ways of becoming an integral part of the project. These are the directions we have to think about, first of all. Thank you, Nino. But as a follow-up question, uh, what authorities do you need? It's, it's your vision and uh, it's, it's a very a precise outline of what should be done. But who are actually your partners from on the governmental side? Uh, in, 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 the, in the actually working on all this because it's a, there is some legislative stuff that you described, but also workforce preparations. Who should prepare this force in Georgia? Well, I think that uh, looking at international experience is very, uh, very much needed, especially the countries which have adopted national strategies already. Um, mm -hmm. If we try to, you know, if we let different companies or even industries try to um, innovate and try to test different approaches, give access to data with certain privacy laws and so on and so on. Um, I think that, that is the right direction to start. In, in, in case of Georgia, uh, we have, uh, you know, um, uh, Georgia's Innovations and Technology Agency. We have a uh, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Economics, with whom we might start defining, identifying the right industries uh, from, we, from where to start the integration process. So uh, I'm happy to say that the discussion of uh, launching the national strategy process has been, has been started in our country and it involved international organizations as, for example, UN Center for Artificial Intelligence and some, um, uh, some, some others, but it's been under discussion still. And as I know, not only Georgia, but other countries from the region are still discussing but not taking certain actions, but there, there is uh, definitely limited time. The pandemic has shown us how, how important uh, it is to do things uh, towards um, digital transformation um, in a short period of time. So I think it's the right moment to start doing things. Thank you, Nino. And now I may, if, if I may ask you, Gary, uh, from your perspective, you have uh, experience of the Atlantic from uh, Eurasian countries as well. And uh, how do you think, uh, first, uh, in these countries, what is the expertise? What is the level of expertise? And uh, as we know, in Belarus and Ukraine, it's a little bit higher than, rather than in other countries that we discuss. Uh, please share it with us and how all these uh, initiatives or uh, uh, entrepreneurial initiatives are integrated with the global AI uh, industry, please. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, part of the challenge is there's a lot of talk and there's not a lot of action. You know, and the thing is, it's funny for me because I've been through this with 15 startups. I started the Top Accelerator in Russia at Skolkova Startup Academy, GVA, Click Software, the company that we started back in 1998, of which I was on the original management team. We sold for $1.35 billion uh, in August. So every time there was a lot of talk and now everything's Israel's great, you know, it's, things change. I believe this is the greatest time for countries to embrace artificial intelligence. AI is the new electricity. It is a beginning, it's similar to the beginning of the 20th century. Imagine all the changes that took place when alternating current was identified, manufacturing, agricultural, our lives got better, the quality of our lives. And we are there today with it. So I believe we need to have 
less talk and more action. So what kind of things are critically important? In Belarus and the Ukraine, think of the, in Georgia, think of the incredible science talent that's there that's untapped. If you go to Belarus, and by the way, I'm CEO of a company in Belarus today. It's one of my portfolio, IREX. So he is actually the co-creator of Viber. I mean, this is a gem. So we've taken some he double PhD. We've taken that talent and now created a global company that has $100 million in pipeline. So what does it mean? It means you need to have multicultural teams. Having diverse teams is proven to be more effective. You've got to be regionally diverse. So for instance, Anatoly, use where if you've got great science talent and it's located in Ukraine or Belarus, use that talent. If you've got incredible operational expertise in the United States and the access to capital, use it. Because what we want to do is we want to create a global decentralized team and where everybody wins. So if you've got the development done in Ukraine, Belarus, et cetera, you actually are creating a lot of jobs. Uh, on the other side of it, you have access to the capital, you have access to being doing uh, exits, you have access to partners worldwide. So what we need to do is we need to be more cohesive. Nina's right. This has been an incredible time. 92% of the companies six months ago, according to McKinsey, 92% of the companies were talking about digital transformation. Five years ago, I was one of the first users of Zoom with Eric. So I've been introduced. Think about what has transformed. In the last five months, they've gone from 30 million users a day to 300 million plus. Look at where we are. We're now doing conferences online. Now what I say is embrace the change. Each one of us here has already started. The thing is, who's going to win? Now we got to take things like AI unsupervised to be able to help us with assistance. The other thing is, think about our own lives and where there's opportunities for these companies in these countries. Each one of us today on this call have over 300,000 items in your personal cloud. 300. The entire websites on the World Wide Web in 1996 were 257,000. You have more on your own personal cloud than the entire web. Now, think about, you know, every day we say, oh, I don't remember if I got that email or that file. You know the file exists, but you can't find it. Why? You've either forgotten the keywords or the location. And it's located in Slack, Telegram, WhatsApp, 20 plus repositories. We are inundated. It's infobesity. So there are opportunities to take that AI, the talent, and to be able to synthesize that. So today you have 300,000. In five years, you'll have 10 million. So imagine for the companies that are in Tbilisi, in Kiev, and Mintz to be able to take that talent and understand how to create AI assistance. So look where there's practical applications. Don't just develop stuff and avoid. Do your customer discovery. Work together. Stay positive. The other thing is, hey, listen, the glass isn't half empty. It's, it's half full. You know, it's not so-so. Uh, oh, I don't know. Maybe it'll work. Let's get stuff done. So if you look at the greatest entrepreneurs that are out there and the companies, countries that really advance, they believe, they keep positive. They actually, instead of talk, they're taking action. We each need to take action and we need to work together. Listen, there's a lot of incredible problems, challenges. Look at the world population. And since the last 100 years, the population of the world has quadrupled. Now, based on that, take it 200 years in the future. Do you think we're going to have to look for other places to be, right? I was on a space tech conference as one of the key AI experts two or three days ago. And one of the things that came up, we for, it's amazing. How many planets are within our own galaxy? 40 billion Earth-like planets. Billion. How many galaxies are in the universe based on the uh, Hubble uh, telescope? There are over 100 billion. So take 40 billion times 100. 
Think about the possibilities, right? We are just in the beginning of baby steps of exploring. We've got to work together to say, how can we use artificial intelligence? By the way, the European Space Agency is using AI for travel today. Think about practical applications. Yes, it's about workforce management. Yes, it's about optimization. Yes, it's about agriculture. But think about where the practical applications. The other thing is, the beauty of it is, a lot of those same out clusterization uh, knowledge graphs, a lot of the same technology can be applied to different areas. Think about where those routines, where those challenges are and apply it differently. You've got the greatest talent in the world. Use what you got. It's amazing. It's like having a Ferrari in the garage and you open the door and you look at your Ferrari and say, oh, I love my Ferrari, but nobody else ever sees it. And you never take it on the track. It's crazy. Open the door, lift up the garage, pull it out, enjoy what you've got. It's incredible. Now is the time. I wrote a, people, a paper at Stanford about bilateral technology trade between the U.S. and Russia back in the early 2000s before anybody was talking about that stuff. And I said the same thing then as I do now. It's getting out the door and you've got the talent. So just, I mean, from my standpoint, I created G, uh, GSD, Get Stuff Done Venture Studios, just for that reason. The reason is what you have to do is have some conduits to be able to get to those global markets. A couple successes. My partner, by the way, is David Yang from Abbey. I don't know if you know David, the Armenian. He is my partner. So we co-founded a company together called Eva. That company is now over $600 million uh, top 10 AI HR companies in four years. If I can do it, I'm not the smartest guy in the world by any means. Each one of you can do it because you're a lot smarter than I am. I'm just a country boy from Pennsylvania. So get out there, go out, build these cross-border teams, go out and use the scale, use the talent where you have, develop these partnerships. And so when I say it, I mean in a very structured kind of way, you know, the goal is a couple of successes, a couple of billion dollar exits. When we did Click Software, it was a little tiny company from Israel. Uh, people said, oh, it's not going to succeed. It's going to go out of business. These were Israeli and Russian and um, Ukrainian scientists. So we brought it over to the U.S. in 1998. I changed the name of the company to Click Software. We, were, you know, we weren't sure what was going to happen. We said, we're going to do an IPO in NASDAQ. We did the IPO in NASDAQ. It was one of the most successful IPOs that year. Company took off. Here we are, uh, August of last year, Salesforce bought the company for over a billion dollars. It wasn't gonna do it. It can be done. So believe in the dream and you know, you've got the talent, just use what you have. I'm sure Nino has and I'm sure you have it, Anatoly. All this has, you have the talent. Let's just use what we got. to the industry. And uh, if I may ask you, Olis, um, a, your company and your product that you're developing uh, is one of the leading, and I think today it's a, it's a leader in the downloads and app store in Ukraine, as, as, as I know. So uh, if, if you can just, uh, in a couple of words, first uh, describe uh, uh, what, what is actually your uh, flagship product. And the second, uh, what, how do you see the challenges and opportunities uh, for AI industry in Ukraine, from your perspective, please. Um, thank you for invitation. Um, nice to nice to be a part of this conversation. Uh, yeah, our company Roof AI. Uh, it's technology company. We are provide providing different businesses uh, with. Uh, tools that allows you to modify videos with uh, humans in such way that uh, some particular identity of uh, people on, on this video uh, can be uh, easily altered uh, in, a, in a second. So uh, maybe everyone of you heard about uh, such stuff as deep fake. Uh, right now is a buzzword with such a negative connotation, but uh, our mission is to minimize 
negative impact of this as for me uh, great technology uh, and provide as as much uh, useful tools for creative in the industry and not only for creative industry um, with this technology uh, as fast as we can. So we right now uh, we are a team of uh, more than 40 people. Uh, more than uh, 30 uh, engineers and uh, ML specialists, uh, one of the top ML specialists in, in, in Ukraine, uh, and more and more people want to join us because, uh, you know, Ukraine right now is on a stage where mm, we already have a lot of uh, great uh, tech guys, uh, which spend a lot of time doing outsource and everyone is uh, uh, bored to, to just to write codes for some guy somewhere and not be able to, to get some benefit from this uh, time you spend on doing great stuff uh, and not having access to the result of this stuff. Um, so great guys with bright minds, uh, big, big experience, uh, looking to, for teams that are trying to build something our, so, something new uh, and to, to become a part of some new big story. Uh, so last two years, uh, we spent a lot a lot of time of filtered best guys uh, to, to, to create a team that will that will be able uh, first of all to create good product and second to inspire other guys in in Ukraine to join us and uh, um, start to build ML com community in Ukraine um, more and more. We have uh, a lot of uh, interaction with uh, data science community in Ukraine. We we are doing uh, we're, we're helping uh, to um, uh, our uh, data science conferences uh, to collect more and more bright bright minds. And uh, as I see, uh, Ukraine is. Ukrainian ML and data science community is on the right path. Uh, I know that there are a lot of um, uh, initiatives uh, from government or, uh, or some other in institutions and uh, a lot of, of such initiatives uh, related to uh, AI and data science and uh, uh, IT in general in Ukraine um, usually sounds very impressive and uh, for for all good and not bad and so on and so on. But but usually uh, where especially when government try to um, to I will call help somehow uh, industry. Uh, but using governmental um, instruments, it not not always lead to a good result. So uh, right now, as I see, um, data science and uh, AI community in Ukraine uh, doing good uh, stuff, creating uh, uh, more and more uh, product uh, companies. Uh, uh, we have more and more interesting events uh, that, that are trying to build community. Uh, but right now we don't have actually uh, efficient uh, ways for government to help somehow or even um, line up with uh, processes that are already is going inside uh, data science and data science community in Ukraine. So uh, I think uh, 
European Union, maybe, I don't know, but maybe in, in European Union there are more uh, working instruments how to cooperate with the with, uh, uh, technical community in a productive way. So I hope uh, we will have also some way to interact in, in such a way that it will not lead to, uh, you know, uh, our Ukrainian Silicon Valley uh, artificially created without uh, organic, uh, um, without organic uh, flu of uh, investment uh, specialists and so on. Um, and right now we are doing what we can. So first of all, uh, industry is uh, successful companies uh, and we, we're trying to build successful company that, that will provide uh, a global market we have a solution that can help um, revitalize, for example, content. One of possible applica applications for our te technology is uh, that imagine you can uh, sell it any, um, in, in some years future, imagine that on your favorite uh, streaming uh, service, you can sell it any, any interesting uh, movie, then sell it, um, your favorite actor uh, and look your favorite movie with, with uh, some other actor that you would like or even with yourself and it, it will take a uh, few minutes to synthesize just for you unique content that only you will prefer uh, or um, or totally new ways to create advertisement uh, with, with mm, more uh, emotional connection with user that uh, um, consumed it, this uh, advertisement and so on. Uh, but also as any powerful technology, it has uh, other side. So um, many governments, uh, especially right now before, uh, for example, uh, election in, in US are uh, seriously concerned about uh, possible misuse of uh, deep fake technology and uh, possible I mean, if I may just uh, to interrupt you I uh, will touch the uh, this issue a little bit later and uh, okay. we'll discuss the deep fake and the fake news uh, with the uh, using the means of artificial intelligence so thank you for this answer and uh, I would like to ask you yes and I can't. Uh, I okay. muted myself. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you. So, EU sees its contribution to the development of AI uh, not only in its technological impact, but also as a value focused. So, uh, the Commission is convinced that international cooperation on that promotes the respect of fundamental rights, including human dignity, pluralism, uh, inclusion, non discrimination, protection of pri privacy, and personal data. And it will strive to export uh, these values across the world. So what uh, can the artificial intelligence bring, bring those values to make their po positive contribution to those values in Eurasia, especially here in Georgia, where it's a, we, we still, in Georgia, we do have the civil society, not like in some other countries, we'll not name them. Uh, and uh, we, we do have um, a much more developed democracy, but still, we, we, we know that uh, there is also some uh, negative uh, tendentions here in the country. So what's your uh, uh, perspective on this, please? Well, um, if we are asking if artificial intelligence can bring these values to Eurasian countries, I think it definitely can. We all know that uh, AI raises some uh, potential uh, ethical issues and uh, in Georgia and I think in, uh, in many other countries, the lack of uh, awareness especially uh, alerts this kind of danger regarding the p p p potential um, you know, possibilities which AI might bring. So first of all, we need to build this awareness about the public good, what AI could bring to the society. What I can um, you know, say is that um, good AI governance, first of all, I think consists of 
um, balanced policy mix with uh, just as much legislation as necessary and uh, just as much freedom as possible. And um, for example, here at Business and Technology University, we, uh, we are the first university to um, be launching the um, a PhD in AI program, which we do uh, with support of um, Leiden University from Netherlands, with support of uh, UN Center for Artificial Intelligence. And uh, the mission of the program will be to mainly focus on um, policy paper, on policy makers and certain regulations which are needed to open um, you know, access of the researchers to certain data pools to open, uh, to integrate the AI solutions to certain um, um, industries in the country. So let's, let's uh, all agree that government of each country is responsible for um, protecting citizens from various harms, but also governments are responsible for making sure that country develops economically and socially so while discussing the ways of engaging in international collaborations, um, I think we all agree that we have a, we, we, it's critical to provide some human-centric, ethical and sustainable approach to every process uh, respecting the fundamental rights and values each country and each um, society has. Um, in the process of fourth industrial revolution, we need to understand how AI can uh, be used to achieve uh, certain goals, but also how risks can be minimized in, in this process. Um, for example, France has a very interesting approach. Um, they have established um, uh, some kind of ethics committee, which works along with other sectoral committees, and it's, uh, it's an interesting way of you know, pro pro promoting fundamental rights. So while discussing the ways of engaging in international collaboration, we have to understand that it's critical to start with providing human-centric, ethical, and very much sustainable approach to the processes, uh, respect the fundamental rights and values, but it, it, it might um, be done in a very balanced way to give uh, some, you know, access to, to public sector data or any other information which is very much needed for educational institutions, for research institutions, first of all, for companies, organizations working to de deliver certain um, AI solutions to the industry. So it's, uh, it's a challenging thing to balance these two um, directions, but we have to think about it. And this is the you know, first step towards, um, towards integrating AI into into multiple industries in the country. Thank you, Nino. And the next question I would like to ask you, uh, Gary. Uh, last elections, uh, US elections, where uh, everybody in this world, I think, is uh, learned the, uh, the term fake news. And uh, I think that the deep fake, and the, we started talking with Olis, and we'll get back to this uh, with Olis, uh, but the, the both the territory and the to the uh, artificial intelligence, both for control their population, but also uh, for their own purposes, maybe uh, uh, beyond the borders of the country itself. And they, we know that there were accusations say, by on the Hill about the Russian involvement in, in, in the states with fake news and their troll fabric. But also, we we know that uh, the fake, the, the deep fake today is much more, or um, let's say, the AI is much more developed to create or to develop the deep fakes. And what do you think uh, should do the authorities? And also, what do you think uh, should be the contribution of the industry itself? And that's something that will, um, I, right after I talk to Olis, what should be the contribution of the industry itself? What means could make a use the industry to prevent the misuse of those technologies? Please. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I was just thinking to myself, you know, the people doing these deep fakes, they're so good, they ought to be working with Disney. I wouldn't be working about the deep fakes. I'd be, you know, doing the next Mulan. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, in, in answer to your question, we always, you know, I wrote an article with the CSO of, uh, of uh, Apple, Rick Orloff, about uh, cybersecurity. So whenever a technology is developing, there's something to defend against, and then they make something better. It always, there's an evolution of this thing. So I'm not sure we're ever going to be able to really capture it, but, 
you know, in answer to your question, we need technologies that can enable to detect it. So at least we know it's deep fake or not, right? So one is, do I know it's a deep fake or not? So, you know, part of the challenge is, you know, understanding that. The other thing is, I'm not sure how much you can regulate it, honestly, because now we're, it's pervasive. I mean, think about the internet. When, um, when Vinton Cerf co-created the internet as DARPAnet, you know, they had no idea it was going to go around the world the way it is. And so I'm not sure we can control it. But what we can do is, one is, you know, so training sets, making sure on the, on the side that we're using um, uh, compassionate, I sent you an article over actually, compassionate uh, training sets. It's very important for us to be able to train the systems right. It's very important for us to not rely. I mean, we've got to, fake news, by the way, has not just happened now, just so we're on the same page. Yes, it's gotten worse, but it's happened for a long time. I mean, look at the time of the Romans. There was, I mean, it's literally, it's been around forever, since the beginning of humanity, I'm sure, that there's been fake news. So this isn't a new thing. It's just a bit more sophisticated and a bit more pervasive today. So I think what we have to do is, one, is we kind of come up with systems that can be able to identify. I love those, by the way. Oli, so I listen to what you have to say. I think what you have is very, very interesting. But the thing is, you know, again, how do we get those kind of things out to the market? And how do we people understand that, you know, this is maybe the deal is, hey, listen, this is certified, not fake, like a UL stamp of approval. We have European Union stamp of approval, not fake. I think that would be great. I love that. You know, if it could be done. But uh, you can you know, fake we, the seal. <laughs> what's that? Then you can fake the seal. <laughs> well, when that could be it, right? And then, and again, as I said, there's measures and countermeasures for for everything. So the the one thing, you know, Mother Teresa said something one time. It was just incredible. She said, you know, uh, it's not about stopping war. It's about pro-peace. Take a different tack to this thing. It's going to happen, guys, seriously. So what we got to do is we got to understand there is going to be fake, uh, a lot of things, and we got to, like, move forward with it. I'm not sure we can restrict it, seriously. I think what we have to do is understand it's going to happen. You know, humans are very creative, right? We come up with so many wonderful things, but let's figure out how we can use that in a very positive sense. And I said that about Disney and Mulan. You know, and but if they're that good, I'd be thinking about how I can make money with it. But I don't care about fake news. I'd be thinking about how I can really create an enterprise so we all win together. And um, I'm not sure, you know, we can debate the answer to this thing. But again, measures, countermeasures happen all the time. There's not really, from my perspective, that much we can do other than coming up with some type of uh, AI that can actually detect it. Then there'll be one, as you said, Anatoly, they'll come up with a stamp of a seal and there'll be a fake stamp of a, a fake, fake seal. It's like doing, um, you know, Louis Vuitton pocketbooks, right? Oh, they have a beautiful pocketbook. Then the Chinese have one. It's just the same. They put a seal on it. The Chinese make a hologram. It looks the same, right? It costs a quarter. Guess what? People still buy it. <laughs> so uh, now we're in, you know, he just, we got to just think differently. And I, one of the things that's very important is we need to tie together as a global community and think about how we can use this artificial intelligence to work together to promote things like peace and to promote humanity, to promote agriculture, things that are really important for us to sustain and work together. And we haven't done that enough. And that's not something I'm sure the AI, that I'm not sure the AI can really do for us. It's something we need to bring together. We need to create these teams and it's a win-win for everybody not win loses. You know, we don't need a win loss. We need win wins. And, you know, I'm absolutely for that. And I'm, you know, I'm a cross border kind of guy. I love all these opportunities that are out there today. I think that, you know, in uh, Lviv and Kiev and, and Odessa and incredible places where there's talent, it's, you know, those pools are just waiting to, you know, to hatch. It's like a, you know, an egg hatching. And what we want to do is we want to create the next, uh, you know, the next masquerade, you know, uh, we want to create the next company to be able to take to the market. And I think that'll try to, that'll start to drive those people developing deep fakes in other directions because they're going to be able to do commercial success 
and take care of their families. And that's really important. Let's turn it into how we can commercialize it and to be able to make it so everybody wins. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And the next question to you, Liz. Uh, please uh, uh, tell me uh, about, the, you've had some uh, idea on how the uh, developers of the, uh, of the software or of their products could protect uh, from misuse uh, their products and also to prevent some deep fakes using their products. Please. Uh, yeah, thank you for for question. Um, it was one of the biggest uh, issue we faced when we uh, realized that yeah we want to to create as as easy to use and as fast as uh, technolo uh, te technology can can do it um, tool for alternating video content. Uh, and then second, second thing, we realized that people will definitely misuse it. And uh, reputational uh, possible uh, loss for us can, can be uh, crucial. Uh, so somehow we need to protect, first of all, us, and then users and uh, people that can be, uh, Harm, harm by, by this stuff. So, for example, we are creating a tool that can allow anyone to create deep fake in four seconds. So, using one photo and four seconds, you can create deep fakes. Uh, for just just for you to uh, understand um, how big. Is it a leap compared to a previous state-of-the-art technology in deepfakes? Uh, to create a deepfake using classical <laughs> approach, you need to spend uh, up to two days uh, training neural network uh, on the data set on hundreds or better tens of thousands of images of each uh, identity. Uh, just to synthesize one video. So if you want to create a deep fake, uh, 20 seconds long, you need to spend, uh, if you have a technical background, you have uh, GPUs, uh, computational power, you have a face set and all this stuff, you, you need to spend at least, at least a few days. Uh, usually a high quality deep fake took up to one week or more uh, time of uh, professional um, specialist uh, and video uh, video editor. Um, what we are doing, we uh, could have created pipeline that allows you to uh, modify face of any person on any video using only one your photo without need to train something. Just one photo four or five seconds and you have uh, up to 20 second video uh, pretty high quality um, a pretty high quality uh, of deep fake with your face so um, after we created such uh, api we thought how we will productize it so we have two types of product one totally B2C product, it, it, it is a mobile app um, and which is pretty popular, for example, in Ukraine, in Taiwan, uh, in um, uh, right now also becoming popular in U US, uh, uh, Russia, and uh, uh, as, I, as I remember, um, a a Asian countries like uh, um, Philippines and so on. Um, right now, we are doing more than two million deepfake videos a day. Uh, but this video, uh, this video, first of all, we, we have total total control uh, on what people people are uh, modifying. So we are providing them content and allow them to 
modify faces only on this particular content. Uh, it is first line of defense. Uh, second line of, of defense is our system is trained in, in such a way uh, that instead of simply modifying uh, in a realistic manner face on, on the video, we also, our neural network also imprints in this uh, final result, invisible for human eye, uh, fingerprints. Uh, you will never recognize some vis visually noticeable artifact, but uh, we have neural network that can, def uh, that can detect with uh, extremely high precision, uh, can detect that such video uh, was uh, modified uh, using our, our, our technology. So uh, I don't believe in generic uh, deepfake detection tool because the next day someone will say, we have generic deepfake detection tool. The next day you will have deepfake technology that can, uh, um, that can hack this defect detection tool. It is, uh, um, it, it is a war that will never end, like uh, virus and, I, and antivirus, uh, uh, because next state of the art uh, 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 on one side will always be state of the art on the other side. Uh, yes, yeah, Alice, yeah. it's clear. And so, actually, you you provide the technical solution when you by yourself uh, create a, a watermark, and you actually uh, sign the the deep fakes. Let's call them. Create within uh, your uh, products uh, to actually to be able to detect what are the fakes and what are the true video. And yeah, uh, if, if, yes, please. Yeah. Even if video was uh, transcoded, uh, color corrected, uh, cropped or rotated, uh, so this invisible watermark is robust to, uh, to different visual manipulation. So if someone wants to um, uh, to clear this watermark out, uh, he will need um, a neural network only we have that can uh, that the, 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 they're able to detect it. And also we have two types of watermarks. One watermark uh, just signing that, yeah, this video is result of our system. And other watermark uh, is more pro version because we have BDC, um, BDC um, app and also, we have more uh, high quality, slower, uh, but more professional uh, model that can create uh, extremely realistic deepfakes. So uh, such, such deepfakes can uh, mm, uh, fool somehow uh, more easily. Uh, so to minimize possible misuse of this pro version, uh, which we are providing in other in our uh, other product, uh, Reface AI, uh, uh, Reface Studio um, for professional video editors and uh, stu and production studios, uh, movie studios, and so on. Uh, and every client uh, is totally de-anonymized. So if you are using our Reface Studio, we know who you are. And uh, if you are using our Reface Studio, you know that every video you will um, create will have your unique uh, watermark. And uh, we will be able not just detect that, yeah, this video is result of uh, uh, our system, but we will be able to detect that, yes, this video is a result of user ID uh, and your user ID. So if you will misuse technology in, in a way that are uh, totally inappropriate and uh, harmful, uh, technology that allows you to, to create such thing uh, will easily de-anonymize you. So uh, our point is that uh, we need to provide people with uh, as uh, fast and as easy as tool uh, so that 
uh, 99% of deep fakes in the internet should be created using our or, or similar technology. Mm -hmm. And then when, when, when uh, most of these deep fakes created by technology, uh, which by itself uh, have this uh, fingerprinting tool, uh, we, we can minimize possible misuse uh, as much as technology allows us. Because I don't believe in, in um, uh, regulation stuff or uh, this uh, virus antivirus uh, war. Thank you, thank you, Alice. And uh, you know, if I may ask you, uh, today we're uh, experiencing uh, the struggle, technological struggle between two uh, superpowers, uh, US and China. And uh, we see it uh, on the, as the outcome was that the UK refused to use the 5G uh, produced by Huawei and they will replace it and swap with uh, uh, trusted vendors equipment uh, like Nokia, Ericsson, uh, others. And uh, here you are the, actually the Georgian Silicon Valley, you even uh, named the Silicon Valley. Uh, and what, what's your approach as a, you're a well connected with the government officials, uh, what is the Georgian approach in this uh, competition and some Sometimes it more looks like a new cold war between the states, US and, the, and China. Uh, on what side are you, or are you prefer to try to be on the fence? <laughs> well, good question. Um, I would not consider to be on certain side. I think that there are uh, very interesting approaches in the United States looking at the statistics, uh, the AI strategy, which I mentioned several times today already. Uh, it's fantastic how well developed the, the whole vision is, and, but still we have to say that, for example, China has one of the biggest uh, data pools in the world, which is open to, to, the, to you know, academia, researchers, to, to entrepreneurs, which is also a fantastic opportunity to, to develop this, um, this tool and integrate it to the industry. So, um, as for Georgia, well, uh, we are, um, to be honest, we are far, far from having the center and very concrete uh, action plan towards which we would, we would act. But um, still, because uh, we are a small country, the private and public sector is very much interconnected and we have possibility to do things in a much faster way than, than uh, in bigger countries. So I think that we should use the, it, the, this uh, as an opportunity and not as a look at it uh, as the challenge. So uh, still we have, uh, we are involved in certain discussion with, uh, with not only governmental entities, but with international actors, whoever have, has a bigger experience in delivering these, um, these tools um, uh, on a global scale. So um, I think that if we will have time and the opportunity to further discuss it, maybe in September, I know that you are organizing a big summit. Um, I'm not very much sure how, how, um, how much we will be prepared to give some certain action plan or some, um, uh, some strategic point of view or getting this topic in September, but hopefully we'll have a much more clear vision regarding the actions which government is willing to take regarding this search. So again, we, we are being um, very actively involved in, in, uh, in communication. Um, we as institutions are pushing this uh, very hard because we, we see artificial intelligence as, um, as Gary has mentioned, it's a new electricity for sure. So um, raising awareness, uh, developing some you know, action plan is what we need very much in our country. And not only in our country, in the region of the world. So let's hope, fingers crossed, we'll have some, some more things to say in maybe, maybe September. Thank you, Nino. And uh, Gary, for you to have uh, five, six minutes left, I would like to ask you the, almost the same question, but uh, from yeah. your perspective, uh, from your perspective, when you look on the, uh, it's more than just technological competition between the United States and China, and we see the, uh, will of the current administration to cancel the students' visas for uh, of thousands of uh, Chinese students, and uh, and we see that they, there are some uh, significant cases of uh, a technological espionage from China in the United States, and they, but 
always when we were talking about science, it was about sharing the information and using, uh, I mean, developing the information that has been developed initially by others. And uh, here we see that it kind of silicon curtain been falling like the iron curtain in the 1945. And the, what would be the impact on the technology in general, but also in AI technology development uh, as a result as a result of this, uh, uh, let's say, confrontation, technological confrontation between the two superpowers? I mean, the situation is the, the challenges when you find China, uh, you know, we say having your hands in the cookie jar, right? So you find, hey, the F-35 is developed and then China's got the exact model have stole the, stolen the plans. I mean, that's bad, right? That is like blatant. So I think, you know, in terms of, you know, I'm for an open world. I'm for people working together, but I also for people treating us fairly across the board. You know, I'm Greek American. You know, my, my relatives immigrated from Greece uh, to the U.S. to be able to have a dream. And my thing is, hey, listen, let's figure out how we can work together. So, I think, you know, this, there is competition between China and the U.S. I mean, the one thing that's glorious about the U.S. is that there are people from all over the world, from Georgia, from the Ukraine, from Russia, from Belarus, that have come with dreams. And the one thing we do have is a dream. And I'm not sure that really exists in China, you know, based on, uh, you know, having raised money there. I'm not sure people dream in the same way. So. One of the challenges we have is that we've got to keep things moving forward, but he also got to uh, trust but verify, as Ronald Reagan used to say, to make sure that people aren't taking advantage of us. And I think that's one of the things that we need to do and, you know, trust and verify. And if things are all right, it's all right. And if not, we stop it, right? If, they're, if I'm not, I don't believe that cutting student visas is the right thing, but I believe that those student visas allow people to steal uh, secrets, that's bad, right? And if they, they've obviously done it for a reason. And so if they have done it because of that, that's bad. You know, I wanna be treated fairly. You know, the, the thing is, it's interesting because I'm not sure how many Americans go to China to study, right? And what kind of, uh, I'm sure they're under surveillance if they go to China. Well, it's kind of unusual. We don't have Americans at this university. So, um, but, so trust but verify. Let's try to open, uh, have a uh, level playing field. Let's try to treat people fairly. Uh, if we got to take a hard line because somebody's abusing the system, we got to take a hard line. That's it. You got to stop it. But Gary, do you think that it will divide the technological world to two parts, the pro-China part and the pro-American pro, pro, pro or pro-Western, collective Western? I think, you know, the thing is we've got, you know, you know, you've got India too. We got to remember India's got a billion people. And I mean, India and I, I'm on conferences uh, a couple of times a week in Indian conferences. I'm, I mean, India is really rising. Some people forget it's not just a uh, U.S. China world, right? It's different. I mean, we're all we all need to work together. So I think that um, it could do that. There's no question. But on the other side, China has a lot of the USST bills, Treasury bills, right? So they financed a lot of it, and we uh, develop a lot of our products and manufacture them in China. So there's a, on one side, there's this competition. On the other side, we work together to keep our economies growing. So it's like a love-hate relationship. It's, uh, you know, and what I hope is it doesn't get to the point where we do, you know, basically discontinue all kinds of technology transfer, because that wouldn't be good for any of us. Nobody. We need to focus on how to solve problems how to solve the issue, the coming problem with population. You know, we can't grow at 4X in the next 100 years or this planet is gonna be out of uh, uh, resources. Environmentally, we'll be in trouble. We gotta figure out how to work together. I think one of the things we need to do is put a you know, stake in the ground and say, listen, we've got a lot of common problem. Let's figure out ones that we can work on together to solve and let's try to work out the issues and differences we have on the other side. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, uh, all of you, for, for this fascinating uh, discussion. And I hope that this uh, industry, uh, thanks to people like you, Gary, you, Oles, and you, you know, will make this world maybe a better and safer place and not a more tricky place to live in. Thank thanks, you so much. Thank you. Great job. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.